Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Hope everyone enjoyed the long weekend. Um, we have representatives from two Michigan conferences that are quickly approaching. Uh, for the first hour, we're going to have um, presenters from the Michigan UFO Conference, and uh, some of uh, those presenters are. Also, the weekly panelists on the fascinating Voices of Con Contact podcast. Uh, we have uh, Deb and RJ DeRus, uh, Michael Carter, uh, Mary Bassett, and <coughs> Dana Stryker. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hello. everyone. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I think. Uh, I'm glad Michael's here. You know, we're starting to get a little concerned that uh, he was on board the mothership. He's going to get kind of close, but it, yeah. I'm still he's a little jet lagged, lag, but but, but <laughs> I showed up. <laughs> well, we're, yeah. we're we're glad you're here. Yeah, uh, we're going to get into uh, you know, the uh, jet lag here in a little oh bit. Oh my God! Yeah. Yes. <laughs> But uh, you know, we are going to let uh, let that one go. But um, okay, um, Deb and RJ. Um, it, okay, when, where, uh, what are the websites for your, your conference? Let's start okay. with the basics. Yeah. So the website, and I'll say it a few times during the show, is um, of course www dot m i u f o con.com. Um, the dates are September 20th and 21st, and it will be held in Houghton Lake, Michigan at the Lakeside Resort and Conference Center. Starts Friday, um, goes all day Friday, all day Saturday, and ends with a sky watch late Saturday night. Sounds fun. Yeah. Um, okay, so, and... You you have two shows you do. Uh, can you uh, tell the listeners where they can watch your shows? Absolutely. So Thursday night we do Mystical Awakenings Radio, and that's been running for about, I think, about 12 years now. Um, we are now hosted on KGRA Digital Broadcasting. Um, it can also be found on Mystical Awakenings Vodcast with a V on YouTube and, you know, iTunes and all that stuff, um, many of the, the normal places. That show is every Thursday night at 7 o'clock, and we focus mainly on, um, you know, experiencers, UFO information, um, some paranormal, some spiritual, because we are all of the above. So that's kind of that show in a nutshell. 
every Friday night at 8 o'clock. We are on YouTube, Mystical Awakenings Broadcast. Um, we kind of smear Facebook with it as well. We don't have other sites for that yet, but we will. And that's 8 o'clock every Friday night. Mystical Awakenings Broadcast is the Voices of Contact. And that, that was Mary okay. Bass's idea. Uh, and it's a very interesting show. Uh, Mary Bass, she it is. Regresses. Yeah, for MUFON, and they allow her to play back her, the recordings of their experiences. And uh, uh, Deb and I and Mary and uh, Deb Cobble and uh, Dana Stricker and Michael uh, Carter has been with us for like 50 episodes, and Bill Konkoleski has been with us too, the director of MUFON. So very interesting shows, very different. Uh, I don't think there's one like it on, on the airway. Okay, and, and you know, your conference – is places an emphasis on the experiencer. Um, what's some of the philosophy behind uh, you know, that emphasis? Um, mainly, you know, we are both experiencers, and our, everybody that comes there to speak is also experiencers. We just have a very big heart for, you know, the millions of people out there who have had experiences and had missing times that really, you know, spent years not being able to talk about it. And we're trying to make the the topic more, more normal, basically, so people can talk about it and people don't feel so alone and so insane. Um, as uh-huh. you know... Mark, you know, a lot of people have gone through deep depression and even suicide and things like that because of having these types of experiences and not knowing where to turn. Right. You know, if they speak out, people don't believe them. Um, People tell them, you know, they're crazy or stay away from them, things like that. So, you know, we find it very important to, to open this up for experiencers to be able to share their stories and to be able to to get a hug. And, you know, sometimes the most important words to somebody that has gone through something like this are, I believe you. It can can really make a difference in someone's life. Yeah, and... and, Oh, yeah, I was just going to follow up with, uh, you know, just last week, uh, Jackie and... Bill Kuselis were uh, covering that with um, th- their research uh, for their Bridging the Tragedy uh, book. And, mm-hmm. you know, people in 1966 and 67 didn't have, uh, you know, the su- support group, uh, you know, that is available now, but uh, so many people were able to work through what happened and so- sounds like you offer the ear to help people to recover from some uh, a very unusual event and process what happened right right exactly and we're lucky to have two people on our panel that uh Back in the day, worked with Bud Hopkins, and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, so you know they have a lot of experience with people that have been in that situation also. So, uh, right, uh, Michael, Michael, you can probably comment on it a little more, or Deb, uh, if you're there. But uh, yeah, so it's it's just we believe that disclosure is going to come through the people. That's what we believe. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's and it's really powerful. The other thing that really attracts me to this conference, this will be my third time attending and participating, is that it takes the narrative, I think, um, more grassroots, away from the military narrative. Because right now, because of you know, the uh, uh, the David Grushes of the world and uh, others, 
it seems like unless it is a a pilot or it's someone who works uh, with the current structure, that that's the only legit narrative of what's going on. And uh, as Deb said, you know, these it, it has to come from people. And so you're hearing another story. You know, I'm I'm loving Lou's Elizondo and what he's doing, even though I was skeptical about it at first. Obviously, Grush and others, I'll be talking about this a little more at the conference. But what we're seeing is the narrative of what it means to be an experiencer and what it means to have a sighting um, being monopolized um, by our government narrative. It's subtle because we all want... Uh, uh, disclosure, and I argue that we're already in disclosure. It, it, it's a soft disclosure, but we, we're already having disclosure. But it's only coming from higher ups. And our conference says, well, okay, that's a perspective. They're focusing more on national security and tech, but there are people having experiences that actually um, are resulting in a change of consciousness. It's not new. I mean, I mean, um, uh, John Mack had talked about this, you know, decades ago, among others. So I, I think that that's a powerful message that you cannot co-opt it. That we are, we are also having these experiences and um, having a change in uh, uh, perception. And I have a question for. Mary and uh, Dana, when you're doing your uh, uh, presentations on Voices of Contact, how do your uh, fields of expertise fit in with um, understanding um, the experiencer's experience and, and you know Mary you're doing your um, regressions H- how are you know the regressions and uh, Dana's psychic abilities um, able to um, help people to understand what they've been through and what may be continuing to happen well with my experience for um the regression work quite often people will come in with just a slight memory of a dream or a slight memory of the experience and so the whole part of that regression is to take them to the experience and it takes them just deeper and deeper into what actually happened the subconscious mind protects us so much from what we experience in everyday life. And so once you take them through that regression, take them through the experience, and then tap into the subconscious and get more answers, 99% of the time people are able to release the fear of their experience because they realize what actually happened versus what their their conscious mind had told them based on, Mm -hmm. on pure fear. So you go through that hypnosis regression and let them unwind and let them relax just a little bit more they delve deeper into that story and see the big picture of what actually happened. And then when you tap into that subconscious mind, it allows them to heal and release the attachment they had to that fear. Right. Well, okay. Mary, you're also a psychic medium <clears throat> as well. Yeah. So in in my in my experience, like reading people, at a UFO conference versus a paranormal conference, for instance, it's kind of the same thing. Like people will come in and ask, you know, I do the reading without any information on the person first. So if I'm picking up on something that possibly could have been an abduction, you know, I'm real careful how I phrase that to them. But a lot of the times that sort of thing does come to the surface. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you're looking for from me, but I also think a lot of my medical intuitive information that comes to me, I'm beginning to think more and more that that is not coming through the same channel 
necessarily as my mediumship or the other psychic things that I get because it's a whole different feel to that. And I'm out there in the big wide world, I guess. I'm known for that probably a lot, I guess, compared to some of the other stuff I do. Um, but I do feel it's almost almost like a channeling of that information versus doing like a psychic mediumship reading that I would be doing in my normal every day. I'm not sure if that translates correctly in this setting, but <clears throat> it's a oh, different wait. feel for me because I do both. And Dana's really good at picking up on the emotions when we're playing the clips of the regression. She's really good at tapping into where they're going and what they're feeling. Thank you. <laughs> you <Welcome. laughs> you thought, I didn't know you knew that, but... I did. So yeah, it's more of a, I'm a psychic medium. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. <laughs> but I'm kind of the odd man out, really. I'm kind of, I'm the newest one in the, you know, on the panel or in the on the show, um, and I do a different thing. But I can also, I guess, like Mary says, I do sense the emotional part of that. And when I'm reading people, and I've read a few people at previous UFO, it's my third one I think I've been to, um, and there is a difference. Like, I do pick up different things off of people before they even tell me that they're experiencers, not just curiosity bringing them to a UFO conference. So it's 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 interesting to me, and I think it's, it's really helped me become a better reader overall, reading in something like that, as opposed to my normal stuff I've been doing since, you know, for the last 40 years. I yeah, hope that it, makes it, sense. It, <laughs> yeah, it, and it, if, Dana, if you're picking up on something about a person, you know, you know just about you know, the uh, moment you first see them, it is that related to uh, the aura or somehow um, related? It's more like for me when I when I when I pick up on that sort of thing on people, it's more flashes of things that have happened to them. So it it, it might be oh. like a you know like a two second flash. I'm seeing something that that happened to That's them almost... or something that the, an emotion that comes over me where I'm like, whoa, what was that? You know, okay, so, uh, that's where almost I'm, like the dead zone. I guess the movie. Yeah, that's dramatic, but yeah, I'll take it. I guess <laughs> that's what you mean. It, it is almost there's a similarity to it. it's like a memory that's not mine, but it's so clear that I know it's a reality. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It, no, it, it it's harder it, it's, to to speak it than it is to if I were able to show you what I see, you would understand right away. Um, but there's also an energy that comes from certain people too, where there's just something different about those people. And those, you know, like when I'm listening to the to the podcast, to the regressions, I can feel the you know if it's a more genuine vibe, and most of them are genuine. You know that that to me also is an eye opener because it's like these this is an actuality this this happened to this person and it's very hard you know in a waking state to probably verbalize that so I don't know it, it's it's very educational to be involved in in the podcast for me as a psychic medium because I'm getting a whole new view of things. But I also have a history with my own stuff with it. So the big okay. revelation, I think, a year or two ago was that I'm pretty sure that my medical stuff is coming from a, something other than what I thought it was. And I think it's coming from them. So. Okay. In, interesting. And <laughs> it, okay. M Michael is, you know, Dana and Mary's um, um, initial evaluations. 
is that fitting into a, a little bit of uh, your um, concept of a mentor in your initiation book? Or uh, there, there's as, as you know, we've you know, just been getting into about the first twenty minutes of. Um, you know, helping people to he- heal and understand what's going on and, you know, the regressions it is, are you finding, you know, the, what you wrote about in uh, initiation is showing up in their work, you know, like the mentor uh, wanting to make the world a better place after the initial healing uh, consultations? Yes, most definitely. Um, again, um, you know, with that chapter on teachers and mentors, yeah, because, uh, you know, after some type of, uh, I think I, I refer to it as some type of baptism, uh, when you have a life-changing experience. And I'm, uh-huh. I'm, not, I'm not separating paranormal from ETs, um, from Sasquatch and all that. I think it's all under one paradigm. And so um, usually after that type of experience, you know, it's life-changing, obviously, for many people. There, there is the, uh, the appearance of a tutor, a mentor, a guide or instructor, perhaps several. But usually, eventually, it'll come down to maybe one. And so, you know, in my own experience, um, you know, Bud, Gene Mundy, Those were the people who had regressed me. Um, You know, people came into my life after that experience and kind of guided me. It was just what I needed at the time because I was having a a hard time uh, because my my reality was was shattered. And um, when you look at the hero's hero's journey or the shero's journey, you, you will find that. You, you you will find it's almost shamanistic in a way, and the right person comes your way, the right book comes your way. But it began with me with uh, people like uh, the people on the panel who said, you know, you're not crazy. Uh, you, you are one among many, and let's listen to your story. And, you know, just being listened to. Uh, was healing in and of itself. So I would think that um, it does fit the paradigm. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's um, on page 45 where you wrote bat, you know, some form of baptism. It's also ah, yeah, 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 yeah just go. right above it. You know, how, yeah. However, they will place a mirror up to see ourselves, warts and all, and... Mm-hmm. All on the journey to acceptance. Yes, and I think that's why um, Deb and RJ's uh, work, Mary's work, Dana's work is so crucial. And there's a depth to it that you won't get from the narratives that we're uh, we're talking about. There's there's a spiritual religious aspect to this that is not being touched on. Um, you know, with 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 our current uh, whistleblowers, uh, at least not yet, and I think that is crucial because you have to move past the tech and the weapon systems and um, national security, which is important. Please don't get me wrong, but I think this is really bigger than all that. Okay, and like we were just mentioning, uh, you know, a variety of points of views. You know, mm-hmm. spiritual uh, tech. Okay, um, okay. The, the, you you can bring to th- this conference. Um, you know, the, you know your recent uh, uh, vac- vacation. You know, and you know, I was going <laughs> to uh, lead into uh, you know, Michael John coming over from uh, Canada. So. You, you know, we do have a variety of points of view or, you know, international points of view de- descending on uh, this conference. It, it, you know, how are, you know, how's, 
Mr. Artson doing and, you know, what some of the, um, um, you know, Euro- European on UFOs and, you know, we, you know, maybe Deb and RJ could talk about um, some some of the Canadian influences that they're getting from the neighbors. Yeah, well, well, Gerard, um, as you know, is a Georgia Damsky scholar with all that entails, you know, with, with the controversy, um, you know, about is this, is, is his work relevant or even real? People are looking at it, again, uh, from a different point of view. I, I Almost as a resurgence, I think that um, Gerard's work and a lot of not just the European perspective, but it's, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel on this thing. You can go back to the 50s and, and, um, and, and hear much of the same stuff that's going on now. There was, there was that spiritual message. Now, uh, again, it was more focused on uh, the Palladians or the Nordic perspective because I guess at the time that's what many people were seeing. But nevertheless, that's who many people were saying that, um, you know, back then they were talking about the environment. Back then they were talking about the link between Christianity and other religions along with um, this phenomenon. Back then they were talking about needing more transparency. So, you know, again, I'll be talking about this a little more at the conference, but, you know, that connection with what's going on um, in our sacred texts and what is going on now, that link was always there. That link is always going to be there. And, uh, you know, if you, there's no saying, if you want to learn something new, read an old book. Um, So if you go back and look at those contactees, you will, you will, you will get the same info, if not more than what we're, as what we're going through today. But, um, you know, it's we're, we're just being saturated with a different narrative, and you know, the ordinary folks who are who are trying to say, "Look, I had this happen," are not being heard. And again, this is where this show um, really, really comes into play, and it's just crucial for moving forward. For, this is this is the year of the experiencer. It's going to be that way going forward, and so these stories have to get out there and be heard. Uh, Deb and RJ, uh, you know, you're close enough to Canada to get uh, you know, people crossing over the bridge from Ontario. What are they uh, you know, pretty much saying the same thing as Michael? They have a different point of view. What um, you know, what what does someone like Michael John have to say? Well, Michael John is an experiencer. Um, He actually, he has quite a story. Um, I don't want to give it all away, you know, on on the show, but he has quite a life story to go with it and how this whole field of paranormal, including um, missing time, sightings, Mm -hmm. um, things like that, really altered his life. He had been through a... um, some terrible things in life, and when he stepped into this field, they really, uh cured him. <laughs> so, um, but one thing I want to say, Mark, is that this isn't something we don't just put on a two-day conference a year and hear from people, or put on a weekly podcast and hear from people. This is kind of our life, twenty-four-seven. And we hear from people around the world, and I love that mm-hmm. you know, otherworldly beings don't have boundaries as far as, oh, you know, that's this country, so we can't, you know, we can't visit people in that country. Um, people around the world are having similar experiences, and, you know, we have learned that it doesn't matter where they are or what's, you know, what's going on experiences now seem to affect people in a different way than they did 20 years ago. I'd like, like to add to that. And Michael, uh, sure. 
tell me what you think about this. You know, some countries around the world are very open about this subject, and not so much the United States, in my opinion. They're getting there, but you can go other places, and let's say like India, you know, it's it's in their culture that extraterrestrials have always been here and visited here. So, but uh, yeah, so you'll find uh, quite a difference in the information that's being put out in different countries. Do you agree, Michael and Mary and Dana? Deb? Oh, I do. Definitely. Yes. Most definitely. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. Yep. Yep. There's a there's a greater transparency, and especially in, in the other hemisphere, in in in, in the the other Americas, South America, for instance. Uh, as you mentioned, India. Um, and, and, you know, we just seem to be lagging behind uh, around issues, um, and mostly because of this ultra, this ultra, this uber secrecy. And, right. and yeah, you know, there, there has to be some secrecy. I, I get that. I, I'm not a naive person. But um, there are whistleblowers saying, and they are government folks, and they're saying, yes, we get the need for secrecy. And again, they're focusing on tech, weapon system, that kind of thing. But, but this is also, they're saying this is also something that people need to know. And it's, it's, it's happening. It's happening here. Um, uh, and and, and I'm, I'm hopeful that it will be more transparent as, as we move forward. But I think there are other forces um, influencing how quickly this information comes out. And, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, you know, Michael, do you think um, ancient, ancient Aliens has uh, made it more acceptable to discuss such topics? Or you know, did that start even earlier with uh, the Twilight Zone? I think that we as a society will, well, in answer to your first question, Mark, yes, most definitely ancient aliens has, the snicker factor has gone down since that show has been on TV. Um, uh, and, you know, Hollywood and uh, entertainment industry have always been aligned with the government around this topic. Um, and so it's almost been like, um, this and, and they're, they're all, I'm not saying anything new. There are other authors who've talked about this. Um, it, it's been almost like a programming of people to get them to get us to accept the possibilities that we may not be alone, or that we that we 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 were never really alone. And yeah. so, it, you know, it's coming at it from all angles. We have Hollywood. Um, uh, now being a little more transparent stuff, so, you know, there, there, there are movies now that are giving away great spiritual truths and great secrets, but they're doing it in the guise of entertainment, um, you know. And so we have um, people speaking out uh, who are clergy or, 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 or spiritual teachers and what have you. And it's time of a great awakening. We're in the age of Aquarius. And so uh, it's an exciting time to be alive. And again, I, I, I will go back to this. Shows like yours, shows like Deb and RJ's and with Mary and Dana, it gives the everyday person a voice. And as we move forward, um, this is what we, we, we need more of. And I think you're going to see a lot, uh, a lot more of this uh, coming forward in the next few years. Cool. Okay. And, um, Deb and R- RJ, um, since you know you're based in Michigan, is or were, were your uh, experiences based on something about Michigan? I don't you know, just say the geography. Um, are are you finding what people? Uh, report to you uh, something about their location is causing these experiences? 
Well, uh, it, that's you know that that kind of figures into you know mi- there's a book out by Cheryl Koth that says Michigan is ninth, I believe, in sightings uh, in the United States. I think California's number one always. Yeah, uh, but you know we have a lot of water here, and uh, oh, they, okay. that, yeah, that might have something to do with it. And because a lot of the information out there is that they they do. Uh, traverse in and out of the water a lot, a good place to hide, I guess. Um, but, yeah, I mean, uh, we've all our sightings have been here in Michigan. Mine have, and yours have, right, yeah. experiences. So, uh, But I want to add I want to add something back to what Michael was saying about the disclosure. It, it is coming out slowly, but we also, I, I, I just want to put emphasis on the fact that there are some people on this planet that don't want disclosure because, uh, you know, if we have to ask the question, how are these people getting here? What do they have? If they have energy, you know, free energy, and and how are they, you know, living so long? So there's some folks that don't want us to know that, you know, uh, because there's a lot of money involved. So we have to be, we have to remember that might be part of the slow disclosure, but we are all waking up. We all know it's there, and uh, we, we they can't hide the fact that we know. Right. And I, I want to add something else to that, Mark. Um, sure. A lot of our personal um, contacts from people, in, in this state anyways, many of the sightings are near water. Um, last uh-huh. year at our conference, we always do a thing where we go out at night and sky watch over the lake, and there's always sightings. But last year, there was somebody who filmed it, and there was actually something that came very quickly across the sky, came to a dead stop real fast, and then went shot right down in the water, um, whole lake. And it's, uh, you know, it's not a real deep lake, lake, but we do have sinkholes, and it's the largest inland lake in Michigan. And... I wasn't terribly surprised because many people have told us they have seen things coming in and out of the water. So, you know, does that make Michigan, you know, Michigan a little bit more of a hot spot? That's possible. Uh, well, uh, you're setting up uh, some questions for uh, the show next week with uh, Stan Gordon and. Uh, we'll probably get into a little bit of the um, uh, three rivers. Um, you know the the amount of rivers and the nearby Great Lakes it really isn't a huge um, leap into uh, getting into a discussion about USOs. I think, it, I think it's a, a fascinating subject. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think there are probably more incidents than what people know. You know, sadly, there mm-hmm. are still many people who are afraid to report <laughs> their sightings and their experiences. Mm-hmm. But we're trying to make a difference there. Yeah, I think you do. All, all of you plus you know Deb, you know to get uh, Deb Cobble on at, at some some point too. Uh, but I think you, you do a great service to people through the broadcast to uh, extend a helping hand. Um, let's see, what, do do you think that, uh, we're getting any closer to disclosure on it? I think RJ said something, it's like, yeah, America's a little bit, you know, behind several other countries, but, uh, you know, how, how's, how's America? America moving forward with this topic. 
Well, this is Deb, and I can say, if, you know, for myself, I have seen, I, I'm with Michael. I think we are in disclosure. Disclosure is happening. It's been happening. And the more people speak out, the more it does happen. Um, I've said for years that disclosure will not come from the government. You know, they've done some things that have helped, but it really is going to come and is coming from the people, the experiencers. We are the point of disclosure. And the more we talk, you know, the more people know. So what is disclosure? (laughs) You know, it's people being aware that this is something that does exist. And millions are becoming more aware all the time. Okay. So that's and, my disclosure. But Michael okay. does a real good job at the conference explaining disclosure and that how, how it's really here. And he, I think you're going to expand on that this year, right, Michael? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to join that, uh, the, the ancient text and, and disclosure. I, um, again, I, you know, I, I will say that we, we're already in disclosure. We, you know, when you have... Uh, Haya Mashed, who was 28 years the uh, uh, the rear admiral for security for Israel, when he comes out and says, you know, we've been uh, the United States and other countries have been in contact for over 70 years. That takes us back to the Truman and uh, um, administration wow. and Eisenhower. Uh-huh. When when he talks about a Galactic Council, when he talks about there are bases on Mars and uh, and the Moon. And he talks about there is a he says there is a galactic federation and 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 you know he's still walking around you know what I mean uh, uh, no yeah. one no one says uh, pay no attention to the man behind the mirror there when uh, oh. Alain Juliet the, the, who was the head of the French equivalent of the CIA when he comes out and affirms and confirms Lou Elizondo and talking about seventy plus years of the secrecy. I mean, that's disclosure. I don't know how much plainer people want it. Now, if they're waiting for whoever's going to be Caesar in the next four years or, or, or eight years to come out on the White House lawn, no one's going to do that. That's political suicide. The only thing that may have that may make that a possibility, at least in my humble estimation, is if there is a Galactic Council, uh, uh, Haya Machet also said that there are extraterrestrial races who want disclosure and some who don't. We know that Congress, there are evangelical Christians who say, we believe this is happening, but it's all um, demons. Then you have on on another side of people in the Pentagon and what have you saying, we need to get. So there's a constant tug of war here. But when your government comes out and says these things, uh, Dmitry uh, Medvedev, Putin's one of Putin's cronies, had come out and said that every uh, Russian politician of, an, of, of a certain classification gets a dossier on all of uh, the extraterrestrial races that are visiting Earth. This man is still walking around. For, he said this on a hot mic. Just look it up. That's disclosure. When Gary Nolan comes out and says that we have exotic materials, Jacques Vallée, Lou Alizar, I mean, I go on and on and on. I'm not talking about bo- out of both sides of my mouth. I'm just saying that I'm glad these brothers, and it was mostly brothers now, but, but it, it, maybe some more sisters will get into it. Um, um, Linda Moulton Howe seems to be the only one carrying that torch, really. But they're saying this stuff, and people – are saying that I don't know whether they're not paying attention to it or what have you, but that's called disclosure. And so maybe maybe we want it in a certain way or it's not to our liking, but I just named a few people who have come out and said, hey, man, this is and, – and I get it because it's hard to tell your citizens that we've been invaded. And that's what all yeah. our religions are talking us about. We have, we have been invaded. We have, we are being invaded now. And some of these beings are neutral. Some of them are malevolent. Some of them are benef- benevolent. And so I don't know how much clearer you can get with it. But it's 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 time to um, 
take the shades off. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, Mar- Mary and Dana, what, um, you know, Michael was talking about some some of the benevolent and malevolent um, um, visitors. Um, you know, when when you're working with um, you know your clients, um, are, are they reporting? Uh, you know, the uh, di- the uh, different uh, characters that Michael has, uh, the insectoids and Nordics. Is is there some kind of pattern you're noticing when, as you speak with people? Well, there's I, always some. Oh, go ahead, Dana. You go ahead. No, it's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm curious what um, you're going to say. The, always, there always is some kind of certain pattern. A t- the typical pattern really is for some reason these people are connected to a, sp- a specific species. And so there's always, you're, you're from us, you're from where we are. Um, and I've had a, a broad spectrum of species. I've worked with somebody who was had archons attached to him and we did the spiritual work so that he could release them and those are the type of beings that attach themselves to you and draw from your energy so those are the kind the negative type and then most often grays and then mantids and i've had the nordic but and even reptilian and quite often you know reptilians get a bad rap but through some of the regression work they're not as bad as it seems and i kind of feel like it's just like humans. You get some bad, you get some that are good. It kind of just depends on what their purpose is. But the biggest pattern really is helping us on our spiritual path to raise our vibration. Um, the ones that we connect with the most are the ones who are trying to help. Oh. I, I mean, I've run into, again, you know, I'm not doing regressions. I don't do what Mary does but I do read a lot of people. And the stuff that I notice is there's a lot of people that are still in, for instance, um, I might be picking up on more of an alien type presence where they're, you know, convinced that they have a demon where, you know, that's a really touchy area because I'm not going to sit there and tell them they're wrong. But you know, it's it's coming in different ways to me, and it depends on the client that I have in front of me, um, how they're explaining it. You know, what their what their experience is at night. Why is this happening to me? Um, I feel like it's, and I think the grays is mostly what I've seen. And again, I'm not doing this solely. I read as a psychic medium, psychic medium. I'm not doing it solely with people that. <clears throat> our experiencers, okay? But running into the those particular things over the course of many years, you know, everybody wanted to throw <laughs> a demon at a lot of that kind of vibe because that's what we, you know, maybe that's more of the malevolent type or they're feeling invaded or they're feeling violated in some degree by something they feel is in their home I'm thinking sometimes that might actually be something coming from the outside in instead of of a, of a demonic entity or a, a lower lower level human entity. Um, but also upon you know I do a lot of investigative work too, so I'm working with. <clears throat> I go into different locations and sometimes I'm picking up on more what I feel is likely this type of vibe versus, oh, it's a, you know, I'm dealing with a a lower level uh, male entity that, that hates women or something. I'm just throwing that out there, but that's the example. Like I can differentiate if it's like more of a human feel versus something I don't understand. And I'm really cautious to throw demon at anything. I just am. But I think that's what or- people grab onto because that's one way of explaining maybe the fear they have toward the unknown in that respect. So, yeah, uh, uh, 
Yeah, Dana, are, are you uh, facing you know, these uh, entities by yourself? Are you with a group? I'm. It's <laughs> a great question. Um, I have things happen to me personally, so I'm, I'm in that respect. I'm I'm facing it alone. When I'm reading a client, obviously I'm there with a client, and I'm not sitting there saying you're seeing an alien or you're seeing a demon or you're seeing. You have to be very careful how you approach this with people. If they're telling me specifics about things, especially at a place like UFO Contact, they're there for that. So a lot of them are coming and they've had experiences and they're they're dealing with that type of thing. But I don't know that till they're sitting in front of me and I'm picking up on it. It's a very it's mm-hmm. a very tightrope type thing. I have to be you know, you have to be careful with people's mental health. You know, you don't want to be sitting there going, mm-hmm. you have a, you know, you have this attached to you or you've got a an alien invading your room. Of course I'm not going to say that. That might be what I kind of glimpse, but I'm not going to throw that at them. If they tell me, that's different. But I wait until after the reading and then we can go from there also. And that doesn't just happen at UFO Con. It happens at my office as well. I've had here and there people that come in for a psychic mediumship reading and then at the end they ask me if I believe in UFOs. I'm like, yeah. And then they kind of come up off it like that's what I think I might be dealing with. So I'm careful Mm -hmm. how I open that door because I think that's the responsible way to handle that. I I don't want to be hurting anyone by planting something in their head that's not there. Yeah. yeah, but but they are opening up to you. As Definitely, time yeah. By. Okay. Well, and now that I'm, you know, I do the podcast. For instance, you know, there's more people people that didn't know that I was quote unquote into it. You know, they're not knowing my history with with certain things. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say there's no such thing because I know better, and to to say that they can't influence certain things. I don't think that's true either. I do think that some things are getting mixed up. We're confusing the alien or the beings or whatever you want to phrase them as being as something else entirely because our brains don't know how to process an alien, but they sure know how to process something they learned in Sunday school. Sometimes. I'm not going to sit here It's all the time, but... Oh, People are starting to talk more about point. the alien aspect of it, you know, instead of automatically jumping to demonic. And I think Michael said earlier that's how some people describe it. Do you feel mm-hmm. like that's mainly because they don't know enough about this sort of thing where our brains as human beings and the teachings and the things that we've seen since childhood we're going to adopt that as a demonic presence when it's actually not that all the time. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't and, know. And that's it's just my take on it. I don't even know if that makes sense to y'all, but that's what I, <laughs> I kind of know what I'm saying, but it's hard to explain yeah. it too. So. No, 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 no I, I, that was fine. And, um, <clears throat> uh, Bill, uh, Con Kolsky, I think I screwed that one up as, as well. Yeah, he's the uh, Michigan uh, MUFON uh, state director. Um, yeah, he's going to be a guest speaker as well. But uh, what's yeah. Bill's um, a- expertise? Well, Bill's expertise is, I mean, he's also a lifelong experiencer. Um, Bill is quite scientific, so, you know, he kind of brings that side of it where some of us um, are more spiritual. So, you know, we find it important to bring all aspects into the conference Mm -hmm. because they're all important. But Bill is a wealth of knowledge, 
when it comes to the scientific end of it and the statistics and, you know, what's going on, not only in Michigan, but around the world. So he, he brings a lot to the conference. I think everybody does. But he's yeah, he's special. Yeah, and like I said, he, you know, well, he's the director of MUFON. And MUFON deals with facts. And, and, uh, but uh-huh. there's a side of him that he's been a lifetime experiencer that uh, is when he's, you know, when he's talking about it, he, he is being spiritual about it. Yeah. yeah. And so it's kind of nice to see both sides of it. Uh, but, uh, so, yeah, I mean, being a director, you have to be uh, a little cautious of what uh, is said because, uh, like I said, it's, it's more of a scientific deal. But they also have a side of them where they have people that deal with experiencers uh, right, and they have people like Mary who do the regressions, and I like that, you know, that because we need to learn all of it, the spiritual side, the nuts and bolts, everything. It right. all matters. Right, and MUFON is expanding. Yeah, they're evolving right along with us. Okay, and, and um, you know, we just have a couple more um, minutes. Um, and then we're going to, uh, you know, switch over to another, you know, another topic, but, um, yeah, a- Andrea Perone is going to be there as well. You know, she has her, her own show. She's a pretty big name. So, uh, you know, you have all, a wide variety of topics that are going to be covered. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Andrea Perrin um, grew up in the Conjuring House, of course, and started out writing books about that, about the hauntings. But as she kind of got more into the field and more people listening, she started talking more about all of her UFO experiences. Actually started at the Conjuring House. So she, uh, she is very involved in the UFO community, She is a beacon of light. She won't actually be at the conference this year. She is dealing with cancer and going through chemotherapy, but she will be speaking to us live stream. So she will be speaking. Her book will be there, all of that. Um, She is just not able to physically be there. But people love her. She's, uh, She's unique, very unique. And then we have Nicole Lynn, who just kind of came out um, speaking about her experiences. And she's another lifelong experiencer. And she has quite a story to tell. And then, of course, you know, Deb Deb Cobble, um, she is totally remarkable and so open about all that happened with her. Um, You know, a lot of people didn't know that the, the person in Bud, Bud Hopkins' book, Intruders, was her. But uh, she's been through an awful lot as well. Yeah, she uh, has some, uh, well, she's, she has some uh, emergency medical situations also, but uh, she couldn't be with us tonight. I don't think she's with us, right? She, I don't believe uh, so. so. But, yeah, she's a intricate part of this panel and this, uh, this show, so uh, very knowledgeable. Then we also have Jeff Turner, who um, I, I call him a little Michael Carter. <laughs> He's a powerhouse. <laughs> and we all just love him to pieces. <laughs> he was there a few years ago. He was last year, but uh, he's been requested back, so we're bringing him back. And it's okay, what's it? It, it sounds like a uh, fascinating uh, conference, wide variety of points of view. Oh, yeah. Sounds fun. You know, you know, we're yeah, going to a, keep, yeah, keep this working. All about everybody's, everybody you know, contributing in their own way and everybody you know, mm-hmm. realizing, realizing that this is uh, – 
even though they're, they're similar experiences, but they're, you know, they're different in ways. And uh, it, we all come together, like, like you said, like-minded people. And you just leave that place just feeling so much better. And many of our attendees aren't even from Michigan. We get several attendees from, you know, all over the place. Oh, United States, yeah. And many come every single year. I think that's okay. something that's hundreds. Okay. Well, uh, you know, th- there's <coughs> our fir- uh, first hour show. You know, we need to uh, leave time for the second hour. Guess it, um, it, if everyone wants to, you know, h- hang up, you could be done for the evening, and we're going to bring on our n- next guest. But I, I just want to thank everyone for being such fascinating guests on, or, you know, panelists on uh, tonight's show. And, uh, um, you know, know, wish you the best of luck on uh, September 20th and 21st at the Michigan UFO Conference. And, Deb, uh, what's the website if they need to uh, look up something uh, before they – www.miufocon.com. We're also okay. splattered all over Facebook. All right. There we go. And, and I think uh, our next hour guest is here. So um, I just want to th- thank you again. You, know, you can ha- hang up and uh, you know get the archive to you tomorrow. And we now have Mr. Brenda as a guest. Um, you know, he also goes by Rick Osman. He's um, been a guest with us numerous he times. He's the and... only one who can get away with calling me Mr. Brenda. <laughs> that's a... That's what I like about uh, all, all, you know, our group of f- friends here is uh, you know, we all know know each other and, and it's just fun uh, you know talk, talking. But uh, yeah, I just want to let the uh, you know listeners know that you know, you've been on numerous times. Uh, you'll be speaking at. Uh, this year's AAPS conference on October uh, 4th through the 6th. Uh, you're the author of The Graves of the Golden Bear. You've contributed many articles to Ancient American Magazine. You're still an advisor there. Uh, so thanks, Rick, for uh, returning uh, tonight and um yeah, so let let's get into what your presentation at AAPS this year. This one sounds very intriguing. Well, I'm glad you think so. I, I've worked a long time on running together long sentences to make a title. Um, basically, I am comparing symbols that are found in two or three or four different sets of writings or symbolism, and I am looking at contemporaneity. Uh, Do they have common meaning? Do they mean the same thing amongst all the users? Uh, Do they appear at the same time amongst all the users? And where all do they appear? And then I'm going to look at maybe what do they mean? Um, And some of them are pretty familiar to people who followed this line of questioning, I guess. Um, And I am using some Burroughs cave stones. I'm using some Michigan tablets images, and I'm using some native symbolism, as well as a couple other sources that I think will be intriguing. And I'm not going to give away that particular part of the story just yet. But I will say this. I'm not looking at the symbolism as being religious iconography. 
I'm looking at it as something entirely different. And it's going to ruffle a few feathers, huh. I think. Okay. So, um, you know, you've written you know, pretty extensively about stone fortresses in the Ohio Valley. Um, you know, like you said, you're now studying petroglyphs. Um, is this really a change in focus or uh, is, you know, the petroglyph study something a little different? You know, what, you know, what's uh, the, you know, going on with you to, you know, uh, ch- change subjects a little bit? Well, I'm not that I, I, I'm not convinced I am changing subjects. It's a continuation of the same study. And I'll put it to okay. you this way. You've read at least most of my articles in Ancient American, and I have talked right. extensively about trade, branding, marketing, trademarking, et cetera, amongst all the people who were here before Columbus, whoever they were and wherever they got their stuff. They had all of the proclivities of modern advertising, marketing, and delivery people. They had a common way of making certain ceramic vessels that contained a certain compound uh, or a a recipe, if you will. Much like Coca-Cola, you you know what's going to be in that bottle. Mm -hmm. And, And some things of human society never change. For instance, if you see uh, if you see a ball that looks like it's been sliced into pieces and it ranges from bluish white to deep blue, you know that's AT&T, but you don't need those letters to tell you that. That is a miracle of modern advertising right there. Everybody knows who that is, what that means. The Amazon smile, uh, the Nike check mark, all these things are modern-day branding uh, success stories, the epitome of branding success stories. But it wasn't invented recently. It wasn't even invented in the last 2,000 years. It was long before that. Did you know that the Gladiators had product endorsement contracts? Well, their owners did. They didn't themselves. Did you know that? I did not. I do now. And, yeah. So when they made the movie Gladiator with Russell Crowe a few years back, uh-huh. oh. it was it was in the script to talk about their endorsement contract, but they cut it up because they didn't think anybody would believe it, even though it was historically accurate. So in Pompeii, in Rome, in every place that they had a circus where these guys fought, uh, these people, not just guys, fought. They had their own, if you will, merc tables. And they didn't sell T-shirts exactly, but they had other products that they sold and they endorsed. And they have, they had seals of that particular, if you know, if it was a, a gladiator or other fighter, because if they weren't in Rome and in part of the Roman Empire, they were called something else by the local language rather than the Roman term gladiator, but they were still fighters. And that is distinct from warriors, by the way. For instance, uh, recently, in August, in fact, when the news actually broke, the archaeologist in charge of digs at the City of David National Park in Jerusalem, or it's kind of in Jerusalem, it's kind of not. Um, in the vicinity. Yes, it's in greater metropolitan Jerusalem, which you would expect, by the way. But they found a seal, they, they, they like for wax seal, but it wasn't royalty. It was one of David's fighters. And his name was Yibo, Yiboezer was his name. So he had his own seal 
of endorsement for whatever product it was on. Um, and if you see a photo of it, and you can go to Fox News and look it up, um, you, you see that, and you will see a miniature, if you will, of a Burroughs cave stone with Hebrew, Paleo Hebrew writing, and in that case, um, a very Assyrian-looking winged something, God. But this Yibo Ezer was to King David as Muhammad Ali was to Don King. He was in David's stable of fighters, and they, they probably fought all over the known world at the time which might fold into future investigations of cave stones because of the resemblance. Okay. Um, okay, so you, know, you have some connections to the Burroughs Cave. Uh, have, have you been to the um, – general area about, you know, where it's located, you know, how, how did you get into the... How did I get started you know, on Burroughs Cave? And, you know, um, I'll tell you very quickly. Artifact. In 1982, when Burroughs Cave started bringing stuff into the museum at Vincent's, Indiana for Jack Ward to see and, and or buy or whatever. I was going to school at Vincennes University. It made the papers locally. I got to read that. And I, I had been acquainted with Jack years before that. But um, anyway, so I was there, but I did not have time to become engaged with it at that time. I did, however, hang around with people who were listening. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of vicariously following the story from the outside and um, then career and life and whatnot. And I was never close to it again, up tired from working for the Navy and started going to AAPS uh, and reading ancient American magazine and became very interested again because you know, I had been there at the very very beginning, but not in the middle of it, just paying attention. Mm -hmm. And and you you asked me, where is the cave? And I have to go with which version do you want to hear? Because so far there have been three digs and a couple of other maybes. And nothing has been found other than what was hauled out by Russell Burroughs in 1982 to 1990 or so. Some 2,700 different pieces we're counting up to where is it? Well, I have a theory, but it's not where Wayne's looking for it. Uh, uh, wasn't uh, Scott in the a area for one of his America on Earth shows? He was in an area of Illinois, Marion County to be specific. And um, that that's a third location, Olney, Marion County, and then I, my favorite location is actually in Indiana, and that is as specific as you're going to get from me for now. Okay. So it, if we get some of these um, similar uh, petroglyphs, so, you know, what are you saying? If I'm, th you know, I'm saying for appear... one thing that that we as a community, both both academic and uh, vocational as we are, we have to get around this thing of always assuming that a relic that we don't know what it was had to serve some religious function. People were probably way too busy for everything in their life to carry a religious function. And I'll show that in my presentation, too, by the way. Some of them are very clearly advertisements. And, I'll, and, I'll, and I don't do the translation, by the way. 
I'm not a, I'm not adept or um, literate in ancient Phoenician or ancient Hittite or Paleo Hebrew, although Google AI seems to be pretty good at it. So, uh, better than I am for sure. Yeah. So, so, so what? Um, okay. So you know we have a, uh, you know the enigmatic uh, Burroughs Cave artifacts. Uh, you know, there's also the Michigan tablets. What you know had uh, those mentioned? Uh, you know, from time to time, uh, I think they're in. Uh, uh, the, um, I, I don't think it's Alan. Uh, it, it may not be in one of Alan Eckert's books. It might have been another, you know, one of his colleagues. But uh, there's a chapter on the um, Michigan tablets. And, uh, what are you learning about the tablets? Okay. The the tablets, the, and I'm not studying them at length. Here's what I can tell you. There are some symbols that appear both on the Michigan tablets and on the Burroughs Cave Stones, and possibly on Brewer's Cave Stones, although there's only like one or two samples. And... There are several scripts in use around these symbols. So these symbols are not part of any known writing system, whether they're religious icons, branding symbols, you know, like trademarks, or, um, you know, like if you're on your phone today and you go to your little weather page and you have a little drop of water looking thing, that's a symbol mm-hmm. and it has a meaning. And you don't need to know that it means rain on the page, it just tells you rain or snow or you know wind with the curly line those things are just intuitive and our brains pick it up really quickly so these symbols that appear in both burroughs cave and uh, michigan tablets and occasionally a couple of them show up in native stuff so i'm looking at did they have the same meaning in all two or three sets were they all used contemporaneously and uh, how long ago can we go back with some of this so on that note I'm going to step out of character here for just a moment you'll bring me back I know okay (laughs) we're going to bring in an academic her name is Genevieve von Petzinger Dr. Genevieve Dr. Genevieve von Petzinger she's an anthropologist University of Victoria she studied symbols found in caves in Europe, and she cataloged 32 symbols that recur over and over and over and over again in the caves of Europe and of Africa and China and Australia and North and South America. Not all of them show up everywhere. So each continent has its own, or each part of a continent in some cases, like Africa, has its own part of the subset. But the largest set is in Europe, and they date to 38 to 41,000 years ago in Europe and in Africa and in China and in Australia. And they also show up in North and South America as a subset. And we don't have a good hard date on those because nobody will in the industry or academia will even undertake trying to find out. However, and I'm going to show this in my presentation, two of the symbols that show up in North America and in Europe show up nowhere else. And one of them, I think I know a meaning for it. And it has carried down to today from 40,000 years ago. So, um, yeah. So I'll be talking about that on Saturday, the 5th of March, uh, 5th of October, sorry. Okay. So, and uh, to return you from Dr. Vaughn Petzinger's um, 
analysis of early forms of writing, what do you what are you gleaning from these uh, petro, uh, petroglyphs, like early forms of uh, communication in uh, America, were uh, uh, you know, should, should we be getting into trans oceanic crossings? Oh, definitely. Uh, long, yeah, long before uh, you know Columbus, the Vikings. Uh, uh, oh, definitely. So part of yeah, the Irish monks. We, yeah, so part of what I've been doing over the last couple of years is working with a film crew. And one of the things we've paid a lot of attention to is a boat, a ship, that is currently in a shed in Montrose, Iowa. And it is a replica of a Venetian trading ship with about 32 tons of cargo space. Um, it is built to the blueprint of an exact, exact blueprint of an ancient version of such a ship that was found in the mud in the river near Marseille, France. And the archaeologists brought it up in the ship. Uh, architects did a detailed drawing. And a guy by the name of Philip Beale, an Englishman, raised enough money to build a duplicate with all the original techniques and woods, incidentally. And it sailed for some 35,000 nautical miles before it ended up being abandoned in just outside of Fort Lauderdale, Florida in a canal. So anyway, okay. that boat so, so that boat proves that they could cross the ocean. So the So that too. was the Phoenician boat and I'm trying to draw the parallel of the Phoenician script, which is down all over the Burroughs Cave stuff. And an entirely different script, unknown, that shows up on the Michigan tablet stuff. And a third uh, group of scripts, if you will, that show up in native stuff. And although I'm not talking about it extensively in my presentation in October, I have been talking extensively to natives who are trying to reconstruct their writing systems that existed before Columbus. I don't have a lot of inside help there, but I got a little clue or two. Okay, well, you know, you you have uh, Ron um, uh, I just drew a blank. Um, the um, Macintosh yes, Stone. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I would you the guy in North Carolina? Where? No. Um, he 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 uh, uh, wrote about the uh, Macintosh stone. Uh, was that a? You know, it was found on the um, uh, UP, and it could be an early form of native writing. Is it uh, kind of like? Uh, Chinese characters, uh, you know. So, are, are you talking about the uh, Newberry tablets? No, uh, it's called oh, the okay. Macintosh stone. Okay, because there, there's another set up there called the Newberry tablets. Um, yeah, it, it's all over. There, there are dozens of cases of writing, certainly something symbolic, that show up in the archaeological record, but it's been completely disregarded because of John Wesley Powell saying, hey, well, if you find that, just ignore it because it's either a hoax or it's just misinterpretation because nobody could write. And he was so sure of it. And that I, that, I, I, that dogma has been followed for 130 years. Yeah, I, I was thinking of uh, Rod uh, Rademacher. Okay, yeah, I, I do re re recall hearing about it, yeah. Yeah, it, it, uh, I um, apologize for uh, 
for getting his last name. Uh, but you know, he's been a guest, uh, and you know, we've uh, got uh, gone into detail about um, um, you know the possibilities of that stone. And it, I think what you're bringing up is actually fascinating. Is you know the development of language, and you know it's not everything goes back to you know like all civilization goes back to the Sumerians. Okay, you're taking taking back uh, forty one thousand years ago uh, with uh, you know Doctor. Von Pretzinger's um, uh, research. Uh, you know, we're going to be doing a follow-up uh, uh, PS show, and we're going to get into like super antiquity of human achievements. Right. That that will be Michael Cremo's presentation. Yep. Yep. And, and they got him listed as the uh, uh, headliner. I'd have to guess. And I'm on the roster right before him. I've warmed up for some pretty notable bands before, but I've never warmed up for somebody like Michael Cremo. Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, it's it, what what you're uh, introducing to uh, the audience tonight is well, and you know, uh, Ron's Macintosh Stone are. Just some of those possibilities. Uh, they're so rare, unique. Uh, yeah, there's yeah, like the Chinese. Yeah. Um, That's uh, yeah, you know, writings on the tablet. You know, what it, it, it's yeah. That's just not water erosion that it, it, um, made. The uh, forms, it, it all, all, almost, you know, it's like the size of a Gatorade uh, bottle, and it, it, the the uh, stone looks like to have that many characters on on it. It almost looks like it had to be drilled out by using a Dremel. It, yeah, so that's not erosion. So, so what are it, what was the purpose of this? You know, w w was it some type of writing? You know, we uh, we can't uh, clearly define it, but you know, it's a possibility. Well, yeah, I, kind of getting on the topic, and this is not something at the the uh, conference, but I was also working with a couple of folks. Um, one, the guy who is doing the translate, who is using Google uh, Translate. His name is Brian Nettles, and he is, of course, he is a Mormon, so of course he's looking for religious connotations in pretty much all of the stuff. And of course, he's going to find it because of you have to use your own context and interpretation to do interpretations. We're using the same stones. Uh, we completely agree on a couple of them, and we couple kind of uh -huh. disagree on some others. So I'm going to show okay. that a couple of these symbols show up in both Burroughs Cave and Michigan tablets, Sober Savage tablets, and we can presume that they mean the same thing because of where we find them within stones, within images. But they're they're surrounded by completely different text. So it's a different audience. And if you find a, a, a third text, it's a third audience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We know that one of the audience is the sailors themselves. And we know why, because of scurvy. And we know what they were selling them and how. Even have the advertisement. Um, and if you know what Burma shave signs were, you'll know what this is. So and some things never change. How we remember things, images, does not change. Mm -hmm. For 40,000 years, we're still doing the same thing. And in one case, at least, it still means the same thing. 
But again, yeah, I'm I, going to hold that one close to my vest for now. Yeah. Um, you know, you know Barbara's aware of a uh, probably has heard en- enough um, about it, but you know, there's you know one of the things I've been research topics I've been researching is you know th- this uh, super ancient uh, dam across the Ohio River. And there's a modern dam built in about the exact same location. So uh, I think it just really sounds like that's another example of in, you know, nothing really cha- you know, changes over time. It might be uh, slight variations, but the original idea of uh, has always been there. Yeah. Well, and it's human nature. It's human. It's the way we think, the way we act, the way we react to things we see or hear or taste. And one one of the things I'm bringing up in my uh, presentation is if these were the the Phoenicians doing all these stones, or or uh-huh. at least or at least pandering to all these audiences, which is what Phoenicians apparently did, um, then they had to be doing a lot of trading in some commodity or another. We know that they traded in the purple dye a lot, and we think that they traded in um, medical stuff, whether it was um, the oil that came from northwestern Pennsylvania or it was whatever it was Uh and and I'm going to make the case that they also bottled and delivered mineral water to the peoples of the old world from the new world And I'm not going to say which spring it was, but I'm going. Yeah, I am. I'm going to say that they they came that it came from a spring in Indiana. Um, and now, that they, uh, was it was there salt in it? No, it's a mineral spring. The salt okay. spring is in Illinois, though, and that one does come into play. There's also a salt spring near Detroit, Michigan, which will also come into play if I can get the right image. Um, uh, I think it uh, may not be the same as the Michigan tablet, but in it, uh, it is an Alan Eckert book, uh, The Frontiersman. He he does co- cover it's uh, what do you call it steel stele, um, you know, like a uh, spire that has. Uh, writings on it. The sacred slab. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that. Uh, you know, while you were r- ranting, I r- ran over to the bookshelf and uh, got it, and mm-hmm. you know, it was just um, went through a six hundred page. Thank you for page. recognizing uh, my column. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, I. I did go through, and I, I was wrong. Uh, I, I didn't think it was uh, one of Alan's books, but it actually was. Uh, I don't think I'm talking about the same, uh, you know, the Michigan tablets, but he uh, does have a drawing of you know, this um, slab on, on there. And it's kind of talking about you know, the same you know, images that convey meanings. Um, but uh, that, that, the, that was what I was going. Yeah, there was also one. Uh, I believe it was supposed to been in Minnesota, a little Vontry, uh pillar or stone or whatever. Supposedly went to Quebec and was going to go on a ship to Paris and never made it. Uh, 
or did and got lost in World War II. Kind of depends on who you believe. But there are many examples of that. There was one at the edge of Mon out of Montauk on Long Island that was in the Museum of Man for a while. Now no points unknown them existed. Many of them were destroyed, mostly on purpose, like the Lost Lunar Stone. Um, I better not get started on that one. You think I was right before? <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Uh, that's why you're uh, one of the most popular. I guess we ha- have on uh, Nightlight. <laughs> well. Thank you for that one. Um, Anyway, so, yeah, there are a number of things that I'm introducing. I've got, like, real close to 100 slides in 50 minutes, so it's going to be just like this all the way through. Mm -hmm. Never a dull moment kind of thing. I think this would be like I think the either the 17th or 18th presentation I've given for AAPS over I don't know, 17, 18 years, I guess. And I missed a couple of years, but there were also a couple of years where I gave more than one presentation. Okay, so you're about annual then? Almost, yeah. I did one remote, though, the COVID and travel time. I did one by Zoom from here, Victor, Indiana, um, and presented in Harris, Michigan, in front of a live audience on a big screen. I and, wish I could have been there. And, and speaking of uh, do, doing uh, z- you know, Zoom conferences, um, have you thought about uh, uh, reviving the Oopa Loopa Cafe with the you know, to follow up the uh, um, Iowa uh, ship filming project you did? Well, I have discussed it with uh, the people who own the footage. Um, mm-hmm. And it is, it's still on the table as an Oopa Loopa Cafe. But we're also putting together a streaming video series and we have enough stuff in the can for something in the order of 125 episodes of 30 to 45 minutes each. Wow. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Interesting. And and it will be uh, streaming from Amazon, at least that's the plan, and we have the first I think it's four episodes uh, in for Re- review and re- review and approval or whatever they call it. Basically, you know, making sure we did everything in the format they want. And we had to redo a couple things because of that. So the first two episodes are um, Southern Illinois, Mark Mott Singer's Stone forts there and the salt, saline river, um, and the salt industry there and the old slave house, et cetera, to Illinois. And then a couple episodes in southern Indiana and then into Kentucky. And we've been, I, I think, 17 states, I think, with this thing. In April, I went from here to. Uh, Arkansas, Oklahoma, back into Arkansas, into Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, back into Indiana. It was just a really rough two and a half weeks. Uh, yeah, yeah, that sounds like a uh, really uh, in-depth road trip. It was. Um Went to Yoli's and my knee was hurting so bad I couldn't even go up on the mountain and look at the stone piles. But mm-hmm. yeah, the but beehive. It, yeah, at least the camera guys got some good footage. 
you know, it, it's it else or you know you look you know just say you know uh, what's in Mississippi is you know cr- crystal uh, trickle showing around Oklahoma what uh, you know what do you how how are you working in all these uh, destinations that uh, seem like they don't have any connection they have connections in that they're all pre columbus they're all out of place or they're or they're under uh understudied under endured less study than they deserve mm-hmm. so yeah crystal uh, we went went to uh Kent Christen's place went to a museum out in Arkansas that's owned by Native American, a, na- a rich Native American. Um, and he feels that his museum is not um, subject to all the same rules as the National Museums under NAGPRA. And he's not giving his stuff up either. Uh, then we went out to uh, Runestone Park uh, in Hebner. Went to a couple state parks in Arkansas and a couple in Tennessee. And this was all with cameras and permission to have them, by the way. That's a requirement. Um, Georgia did not give us permission, so we didn't do anything in Georgia. <laughs> and we went to the Valentine Museum in Virginia with Vince Barrows and went over some of Valentine's personal stuff. Well, not that he collected himself, but he bought it. Uh, and it's all out of place artifacts that are considered hoaxes by the academics because of the subject matter. Guy on a horse, guy holding a gun, guy smoking a hookah. Um, anyway, yeah, we saw a whole bunch of artifacts, went to a whole bunch of mound, mound sites, Went up into Wisconsin for the effigy mound sites, along with some O-Chunk and Ojibwa folks who showed us around and told us their versions. And we got that on film. Um, Rock Lake, effigy, National Monument. Um, Wow. Lots of places. What's the Rock Lake? What is it, Rock is Lake? With- well, that is the one where um, uh, Frank, Joseph, and Mary were out in a boat with sonar, fancy fish finder, I think, and saw what they thought was inscribed stones under the water in Rock Lake. And supposedly in the 1930s during the drought, the water got so low that you could see a bunch of these things sticking up, and they had inscriptions on them, supposedly. So while we were there, tried to get a drone shot. It, we could have done better a different time of day, different angle, different sun, et cetera, but we did get a little bit of stuff. We found a couple of rock piles that we could see from the air. Um, but there should be like dozens or hundreds of them according to all the previous witnesses. Uh, Rock Lake is supposed to have been a sacred site shortly after the glacier started melting and stayed that way for a uh, long time. Uh, state is it in? Wisconsin. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, It is an intriguing place. Of course, it's all built up around it now. So you can't really make much sense out of the terrain as it would have been you know, eight, ten, twelve thousand years ago. Uh-huh. Um, we do know that the water level has been managed in historical times a little bit, but we also think that it was an artificial like thousands of years ago.
Okay. That makes makes sense. I just I really enjoyed studying the uh, um, remnants of the Ice Age. Yeah. So have you watched Graham Hancock's thing on Netflix? Uh, I, I I have not. I've been uh, developing uh, ideas for m- more nightlight shows and working on a top secret project. So I, I, I've, secret. I yeah, I, I've I've missed uh, Graham's um, show, but um, no. Uh, Hopefully soon I'll uh, be able to get, get caught up on projects like that. Well, it's worth a watch if you get a chance. So, um, but on that note, the only other person, in my opinion, who is of that caliber and has had similar experiences with academia versus television shows is Michael Cremo. And back in the 90s, he did Forbidden Archaeology on NBC, and NBC mm-hmm. caught, caught hell from all of academia about how his uh, pseudoscience should not be shown on television. Okay. So well, he'll, he'll be discussing that in a couple weeks. Yes. Yeah. And I, I'll have the pleasure of sitting on a panel with him, kind of like the guys did on the first hour of this show tonight. So, yeah, what well, uh, uh, Michael makes, um, you know, very excellent points. Uh, you know, there's you know, these reports about, uh, you know, just say uh, evidence of. Uh, animals being uh you know prepared for a cookout uh during the uh, uh Pliocene uh time period you know, well, you know, we're kind of looking that. at yeah it's uh it, it's not even ice it's prior to the ice age so uh, Correct. you know th- there is um uh, you know, when, when you mentioned the, you know, 41,000 years ago of uh, uh, writing system, it, you know, Michael's uh, going back to uh, Under maybe million, closer. Billions. Yeah, 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 yeah cl- at least a million years of um, people having – it developed certain technologies and you know uh you know there's nothing else at that level where you know the artifact or the uh sculpted bone or you know the um bone with cut marks on it um wooden structure so you know so you know you know, the, you know we'll get we'll get into all all the things like that as well. So um, ancient writing isn't out of the uh, you know, realms of possibilities. Um, so it's, I, I'm, I'm looking I forward to, to today about a dig in Namibia near the tallest waterfall on the planet. Um, they were digging in the riverbed knew that there was a lot of very old stuff there. We're talking half a million years old. And they found very clearly the remnants of a wooden structure, a half a million years old. So people have been a lot smarter than we've given them credit for for a very long time. Yes, and, and yeah, they're, they're able to uh, fashion a house, keep the walls standing, a roof on them, so yeah, uh, uh, they had engineering skills. Um, uh, what'd you say, half a million years ago? Yeah, and they probably did not have any fasteners. 
as we would recognize them. Um, you know what? Okay, we have you know, unfortunately only seven minutes left, but uh, you know you have some great colleagues who are going to be at the conference as well. Uh, you know, Lee Pennington and Joe Baker and. Uh, be, be there what you know uh, they're they're always up to some something thought provoking what yes what's the uh, latest lee, with them lee uh at 83 or, or maybe he was 82 at the time anyway he went up on a mountain in tennessee third try to find it but he found a dolman up on a mountain in tennessee dolmens aren't supposed to exist in north america but they do um Let's see. Um, well, I had that list in front of me, but it has escaped me. Um, yeah, in just a few minutes. We have Bob Trepke and a few other folks are continuing uh, investigations in Michigan. I kind of wanted to break in with your UFO folks because they're kind of in the same area. Um Anyway, yeah, there's a whole bunch of great guests or speakers on the roster for October 4th, 5th, and 6th. And I am uh, on Saturday evening next to the last. And I don't even know right now what time of day that is. But um, teachers and students can get admission to the conference for free. does not cover meals or accommodations. And it's in Harris, Michigan, at Island Resort Casino and Hotel. So what else do we need to talk about real quick? Uh, let's see. I think uh, Jay Wakefield's uh, book is interesting. He has lots of uh, captivating observations of like the Canary Islands. Uh, we had a good time talking with him uh, was a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, Lon Krieger's uh, uh, presents great information about the uh, uh, gardening beds of Michigan. Right. I would have to go. Uh, you know, the, uh, the only time I've been to Michigan was uh, just kind of, you know, like a, 30 minute layover <clears throat> at the Detroit airport. Um, some point I need to go there because there's so many people are, uh, you know, uh, lawns writing about the ancient garden beds and the mastodons that are found. It uh, sounds like a place I need to visit at some point soon. Well, yeah, uh, and there's there's so much more than that, to be honest. So Crystal Trickle is going to be back talking about her light and shadow investigations. Um, I think this will be the third, maybe fourth time she's been there. And then uh-huh. Keith Keith Sealand has been doing some line of sight work, but not for the same reasons I do it. He's doing it for archaeoastronomy. We're sharing some tools because he's found that the the tubes, the stone tubes, work for his stuff just like they do for my stuff. And then something new this year at AAPS, I know i just got four minutes left, um, we're doing six and 60, six programs of 10 minutes each and 60 minutes. Uh, Oedith Harris is doing one about the ancient art of foot reflexology, Sue Bollinger and Joe Loricon, um, understanding the value of LIDAR. Joe Loricon is also doing another one using phone apps for personal research. Sue's doing another one, properties of paint used in the Beaver Island stones. Uh, And it's not all just red ochre. Um, Donna and Fred Marsh talk about their 10,000 BC statuettes. I'm anxious to see this one. 
And the last one is uh, Derek Cole. How many pounds of copper can you? And I have a number, but <laughs> uh, so, so, that sounds like research that is very much needed to help settle some of these disputes about you know the the routes of transporting the copper how how many trips would it have taken i uh, uh, that sounds like a, a very needed uh a, a experiment and the conclusions need to be uh, presented that uh, that sounds like a really neat well the the naval architecture problem uh, you know how much weight can it be is easy mm-hmm. but it it's the route as you mentioned um and then at some point you've got to get out of the canoe and put it into something more seaworthy right so last two minutes give or take um I have undertaken I have entered a contest see if I can get get to the right screen for that I guess I can't anyway I've entered a contest called the face of horror <laughs> I know that's ironic um but it, it pays, and uh, there's a ghost hunt and a bunch of other stuff involved. So I'm going to ask people to go vote for me, preferably. But, um, it is faceofhorror.org slash 2024, and then uh, me, Rick Osmond, slash Rick Osmond. And you can get one vote for free if you really like me. Throw money at it. Okay. Um, Rick, we're uh, down to a few seconds. Thank you so much for uh, being a guest tonight. Good luck at the AAPS conference. Uh, Get the archive to you uh, tomorrow. And uh, thanks again for uh, the audience for tuning in tonight. And we'll talk to everyone soon. Thank you, Mark, for letting me rant.